Hey guys, I have here a lithium iron phosphate battery from batteryhookup.com. This is a 12 volt, 32 amp hour, 384 watt hour uh, battery pack, and it is made by Ultralife. And I saw someone shared a link to these, so I thought it'd be interesting to pick one up and tear them apart and see what's inside. Now, unlike a lot of the modules we tear down here, uh, this is designed to be a drop-in replacement. So there are a positive and a negative terminal. It's got a BMS internally. You don't have to worry about any BMS connections or anything like that. So I'm anticipating to see a 4S configuration of some sort. This weighs about 10 pounds, just over seven and a half wide, it's five inches deep, and it's six and a quarter tall. This was actually quite a bit smaller than I had anticipated based on the pictures I saw on their website. To start this off, I see there is a strip going across the top here. Now on a standard lead acid battery, you would usually find ports, you know, like a vent or something like that, or ports to put water in if it's a flooded battery. I'm sure there's just a pressure vent under here, but we're going to take it off and see anyway. Yeah, uh, yeah it looks like a vent. I see this one is closed, but this one I can see down in there. There's something red in there. All right, so the way these kind of batteries usually work is this seam, this lid usually comes off around the top and it's typically glued on and you have to cut it. But interestingly, I can see that the two corners are raised quite a bit. You can see there's more space here and here than there is in the center. So I'm going to see if I can pry this lid off without using a Dremel or anything to cut into it. Now, I think it goes without saying too that you should not be doing this. You should never open up any kind of battery like this. So just be safe and uh, take a look at what's inside with this video rather than trying to do it yourself. So let's... You gotta be very, very careful because I wanna make sure I am not puncturing a cell or touching any of the electrical connections inside. So I think I got it. Okay, so here we can see the main negative leads coming up and the main positive leads coming up. There are three pieces of 14 gauge wire and this is a standard silicone cable with a 200 degree insulation reading. Got a piece of fairly thick adhesive cardboard here. Ah, oh, there's the fun stuff. All right, so these are fairly large cells. I can't really tell what form factor they are yet, but uh, here's a label with some Chinese writing. And then we can see quite a large BMS over here. So let's see if we can slide out this entire assembly. All right, what have we got here? And there's lots of tape holding it together, that's for sure. So, let's... I'll tell you what, they got this thing wrapped up pretty good. All right, so here is the main positive side of the battery pack. So what we have essentially is two separate 20 cell blocks and those 10 cells are paralleled and then wired in series with the next set of 10 cells. So what we have here is a 4S 10P battery pack. And here's the other side where the series connections are occurring. So you can see all 20 are connected together. And then the negative off of this pack comes over to the positive of the second pack and completes the series to pair. And these four white wires here are the balance leads for the BMS which I think I'm going to have to cut to take this apart any further. And so now I'm going to disconnect the BMS itself. That way I can take a look at it better. And we'll set this battery pack aside and take a look at that shortly. Let's have a look at our BMS here and see what we got. There is a lot of insulation on this. You know, a BMS is gonna get warm as it's balancing and I'm guessing they want to keep that heat off the battery itself. I don't know, what is that, 3 8 inch thick or so? Pull that off. And you can see the soldering there. It's not too bad of a job. It's not super clean either though. I want to see if I can get this heat sink off so we can take a look at what's on the board itself. All right, so there were 24 screws holding this top plate on. 
There's an array of 2x10 here, and then there were four more in the corner. 24 screws. So under there, we can see where the transistors are, which control whether or not the BMS is on. So what happens is the power from the battery side flows through these transistors and then out the negative side. And then when the BMS detects a fault, it flips these off. There are two blocks of transistors. So I assume one is for the charging side and one is for the discharging side, since current will be flowing in opposite directions when each of those actions occurs. So taking a look at the bottom side, we can see where our balance leads connect. And it looks like this is designed to support up to a 15S battery. And then you would just solder on these additional components if you have a larger series battery pack. So we have the uh, bleeding resistors here if it needs to balance. We have the and we have the transistors to turn those on and off, as well as the chip to control each individual cell. And then for the board with the MOSFETs, we have another 20 screws on the bottom. So there is a total of 40 screws holding this heat sink down. I mean, I suppose the screws on top were just holding on the cover, not the heat sink. So I guess that's why there are 40, but still. So taking a look at the battery cells themselves, uh, I can't read Chinese and some of it's covered, but I don't see anything on these numbers that makes sense to me. Uh, this one does say 3.33 to 3.34, so I don't know if that was the range of cells that they put in. I see 14.86 and 14.89, so perhaps that was some testing or charging parameters there. And up at the top here, I see 3260 to what appears to be 3290, so maybe that's the capacity of the individual cells. Again, I'm not sure. What I would like to try to do is remove one of them to see if we can test the individual cell. So we're just gonna grab one at random here from the end. Spot welds are decent. I'm actually surprised they're not welded any better, but it did rip holes in the strip when I pulled it off. So I guess they are tacked down pretty good. Now on the positive end, I can't just pry down like you saw me doing the negative end because the casing itself around the edge here is negative. And if I do that, I'm going to end up shorting the cell out. So I'm gonna see if I can cut it and snip it a little bit with my battery hookup uh, snips here. Let's see if that works. Just very carefully peel it off. Okay. Now, these individual cells are unfortunately glued together here. So there we go. All right, so there are no markings on the actual cell itself. If we slide the cell out of the sleeve, I see LHK, HQ, but no brand or model markings at all. And there's quite a decent uh, insulator here on the top. And it's not paper like you usually see. It appears to be some kind of hard plastic, which is nice. So you can see the cell underneath if you pull that away a bit. And this does appear to be a 26650 cell. I have here an A123 battery, which is a 26650, and they are the same exact dimensions, the same height, and they're the same diameter as well. Now it's occurring to me as an afterthought, unfortunately, that uh, I should have tested this battery before I took it apart to see what the capacity was of it as a whole. But what I guess I'll do is just do voltage checks of each series pair, and then I'll just test one cell and see what the capacity of that cell comes out to be. We have 3.32, 3.31, and then on the second module, 3.31 and 3.32. So they're all within 0.01 volt of each other, which is great. All right, now I don't really like these uh, cardboard sleeves on here. You know, they add a lot of thickness to the cell and they slide out easily. So what I'm gonna do to remain safe here is apply a standard uh, heat shrink to the cell. And I picked these up from uh, Keith's store. I try to support him whenever I can and I buy a ton of supplies and stuff from him. So here we have a nicely wrapped cell. Almost looks brand new. All right, so I'll be using the iCharger X6 to test the capacity of this cell. I'm pretty sure I had purchased 26650 holders before, but apparently I cannot find them. So I made one out of this clamp and there's plenty of tension to ensure good contact. Uh, however, while not damaging the cell itself, I then clipped on a pair of alligator clips to each bolt, which go into the iCharger. And I have my two balancing wires connected as well. Even though I'm only testing one cell, I still connect the balancing wires because that helps eliminate the resistance in the wire itself and give a more accurate result. I don't have a spec sheet for this battery itself. However, this battery pack as a whole was 32 amp hours and I know there are 10 cells in parallel, which gives me 3.2 amp hours. 
And then for the discharge current, I'm going to take 3200 milliamp hours and multiply that by 0.2 since a standard discharge test is typically done at a 0.2 C rate. And we're going to discharge the cell at 640 milliamps. So this is a lithium iron phosphate cell. Push and hold. We want to charge at one amp. All right, so we'll be back when that finishes charging. It looks like it's almost charged up the entire way, but uh, we'll top it off for the capacity test. All right, so the battery has completed charging here. It charged up to 3.60 volts. So we're now going to begin the discharge test. So we saw that a 0.2 C rate was 640 milliamps. So I'm going to set this for 700 milliamps. And we'll go down to 2.5 volts since that is a typical cutoff for a lithium iron phosphate cell. And this will take several hours to complete. So we'll be back in a bit. All right, guys. So the capacity test here finished up and we came out to 2,565 milliamp hours of capacity in one cell. Now I do believe these to be uh, 3200 milliamp hour cells, so I was expecting a little more capacity. I'm not necessarily disappointed, it was just a little bit lower than I thought. And that is around 80% of the original capacity. So I don't know if the other cells would test any better. Again, I only tested one, it's not a very large sample size. Also, while this test was running, I did find out some information on this BMS, and this is a this is a 60 amp continuous BMS with a 200 amp surge rating. This was selling for around 50 bucks on eBay, though there was only one seller, so I'm not sure, you know, how reasonable that price is. I'll leave a link to the specification sheet I found for this BMS in the description if you are curious. Also, while the test was running, I removed the other 39 cells, and I got them ready for new heat shrinks. Unfortunately, I don't have any more heat shrinks left for 26650 cells, so I ordered a new batch from Keith, and uh, he shipped those today, so hopefully they will be here in a few days. And of course, I recommend using these batteries the way they came in the original 12 volt arrangement. I don't think it's necessary to separate individual cells like this, but this was a fun project for me and I get to show you guys what was inside. I do see some other 12 volt modules for sale on their website, so maybe I'll pick up another one or two, depending on how this video works out. Uh, I do enjoy these kind of videos. So if you liked it, please hit that button down below. Any questions or comments, you can leave those as well. And thank you very much for watching.